French football is in crisis. It's a statement that could have been made at almost any stage over the last 120 years, but it is particularly true of the present day. On the face of it, you might think that French football is doing just fine. Of the last seven FIFA World Cup finals since 1998, France have competed in four of them. No other national team has been in more than two, and France is also the only national team during that time to have won more than one World Cup. Ligue 1 is one of Europe's big five leagues, and has been for some time, home to some of the best players on the planet, and the finest talent factory in all of world football, surrounds France's capital city in the Ile-de-France region, and shows no signs of slowing down. Ranked second in the FIFA World Rankings, France are the reigning UEFA Nations League champions, and despite having headed into the 2022 World Cup with significant headwinds, including dreadful form and a pretty major injury crisis, France still made it all the way through to the final, where they fought back from 2-0 down to draw with Argentina, and could only be beaten on penalties. All in all, not bad then. But behind the scenes lies a murky underworld, one of the most sordid football associations on the planet, and a series of salacious scandals involving some of France's most high-profile players, coaches, and administrators. French football has always been like this to a certain extent. France's first World Cup captain, Alexander Villaplan, became a Nazi collaborator during World War II, leading his own Arab death squad under the puppet Vichy regime. Less fatal, and far more amusingly, even earlier than that, a dispute between FIFA, which was only four years old at the time, and the Union of French Athletic Sports Societies, which used to regulate French football, resulted in France sending two football teams to the 1908 Olympics in London, one controlled by the USFSA, and one controlled by FIFA. Both France teams were knocked out by Denmark, incidentally, France B losing 9-0, and France A 17-1. In more recent times, Marseille were stripped of their 1992-93 league and title, and kicked out of the top flight of French football after the club's bribery scandal was exposed during the same season that Marseille actually became the first and still the only French club to win either the Champions League or the European Cup. And sandwiched in between France's extraordinary World Cup successes, Les Bleus' 2002 and 2010 World Cup campaigns were marred by controversies, resulting in shock group stage exits. Now French football is facing arguably its greatest crisis yet though, or series of crises, I really should say, ranging from fan violence and petty personal feuds, to allegations of endemic corruption, kidnappings, and widespread sexual abuse, all hiding, with varying degrees of success it must be said, behind the veneer of one of the most successful footballing nations on earth. France is among the most influential footballing nations on the planet, not just on the pitch but off it. Following the 1908 Olympic debacle, and a series of disputes in the early days of French football, the French Football Federation was founded in 1919 to replace the Union of French Athletic Sports Societies as the governing body of all football in France. Jules Rimet became the FFS's first president, and two years later, he also became the third president of FIFA. The first FIFA president, incidentally, was also a Frenchman. Rimet is like the godfather of French, and in some senses all of international football. He played a pivotal role in the 1904 founding of FIFA, then aged only 31. He oversaw football at the 1908 Olympics, and most notably of all, he pioneered the creation of the FIFA World Cup under his presidency in 1930. Remey's reign as FIFA president, which is the longest of any FIFA president in history at 33 years, was not without controversy. Europeans criticised his decision to host the inaugural World Cup in South America. South Americans fumed at both the 1934 and 1938 World Cups being held in Europe back to back, and perhaps more legitimately than both of those, there were, and indeed continue to be several questions asked, of the decision to host the 1934 World Cup under the fascist rule of Italian dictator Benito Mussolini, with Rome and FIFA, 
accused of allowing Mussolini to use the World Cup to promote his regime, and then giving him undue influence over several aspects of the tournament, which was ultimately tantamount to corruption. His 23 years as president of the French Football Federation, by comparison, were viewed as being almost entirely positive. Under his watch, France were one of only four countries to feature at each of the first three World Cups. They won the right to host the 1938 World Cup in a landslide, where they reached the quarterfinals, and in 1930, French football turned professional, and soon after that, an all-professional nationwide top flight, known as Ligue 1 was founded. Rimé is long gone now. He died in 1956, a whole 42 years before France won their first World Cup, by which stage the famous Jules Rimé trophy had been stolen, melted down by thieves in Brazil, and replaced with the far less imaginatively named FIFA World Cup trophy, but French influence within world football, and the power of the French Football Federation still lives on. Indeed, the 2022 World Cup in Qatar, which was the most controversial World Cup since Jules Rimet handed Mussolini hosting rights in 1934, if not of all time, many people contest, would not have been possible without the French. One of France's greatest ever players, Michel Platini, was the second most powerful man in world football when Russia and Qatar were announced as 2018 and 2022 World Cup hosts in 2010, having been elected as UEFA president in 2007. Platini was renowned for his close relationship with FIFA president Sepp Blatter, but it was widely reported that he was supporting the United States' bid to host the 2022 World Cup. Until, that was, he was invited for lunch at the grand setting of the Elysee Palace with the French president Nicolas Sarkozy and the Qatari Emir Sheikh Hamad bin Jassim. After which point, apparently totally coincidentally, Platini became an advocate of the Qatari bid to host the World Cup. The purpose of that lunch has never been properly explained, but despite admitting that after it, he understood fully well that Sarkozy wanted him to back Qatar's bid, Platini claims that it had no influence upon him. Sarkozy, meanwhile, claimed in 2015 that he never attempted to influence Platini, and quote, wouldn't have had the power to do so, despite being the French president. Qatar won the right toast the 2022 World Cup, with 14 votes to the United States' 8, and over the next six months, France announced a series of lucrative trade links with the gas-rich Gulf microstate, most notably the sale of 50 Airbus planes to the state-owned Qatar Airways in 2011. France has since had a closer relationship with Qatar than any other European nation. That extends very firmly into the realm of football, since almost immediately after Platini switched his vote and Qatar won the right to host the 2022 World Cup, another Qatari state-owned enterprise, namely B in Sports, agreed a lucrative deal to acquire the broadcasting rights of Ligue 1 games in France. And in June 2011, the Emir of Qatar bought PSG, the biggest football club from the French capital of Paris, through a subsidiary of Qatar's sovereign wealth fund. PSG have won 8 out of the last 10 league on titles, having won just 2 in the preceding 41 years since their founding in 1970, becoming the dominant force in French football. Qatar and France's relationship is so close, both economically, militarily, and within the world of football, that France agreed to help Qatar secure their own airspace throughout the 2022 World Cup. That brings us rather nicely to PSG, who are the behemoths of French football since their Qatari takeover 12 years ago, and are at the centre of several scandals all of their own. The president of PSG is a man named Nasser Al-Khalifi, who you have probably seen standing next to big-name signings like Neymar and Kylian Mbappe when they have been unveiled as PSG players. Al-Khalifi is a Qatari national, unsurprisingly, and a former athlete himself who reached the dizzying heights of world number 995 in the tennis world rankings at his peak in November 2002, which is about three places higher than I reached, I think, that one time that I represented my school at tennis because all of the kids who could actually play tennis just happened to be ill. 
Alongside being PSG president, Al Khalifi is the chairman of Qatar Sports Investments, the subsidiary of the Qatar Investments Authority that owns PSG. He is the president of the Qatar Tennis Federation and the chairman of the B and Media Group, which acquired the rights to broadcast league and games in France immediately after the French UEFA president backed Qatar's bid to host the 2022 World Cup. He's also a minister without portfolio in the Qatari government, appointed by the Emir of Qatar, Sheikh Tamim. A busy man then. Named as the most powerful man in French football by L'Equipe in 2016, and again but by France football in 2020, Swiss courts opened an investigation into Al Khalifi in October 2017 on suspicion of private corruption in the allocation of television rights for the 2026 and 2030 World Cups for the Middle East and North Africa international media market, but three years later he was cleared. In March 2022, the spotlight was put on Al Khalifi once again, this time after he was alleged to have assaulted a linesman, broken his flag, and threatened to murder a Real Madrid employee after PSG lost 3-2 on aggregate to Los Blancos in the round of 16 of the Champions League. Once again, following an investigation, UEFA cleared Al Khalifi of all charges related to the incident. Most recently of all, indeed just last month, Al Khalifi was reported to have been implicated in a kidnapping and murder investigation. This comes in light of French Algerian citizen Tayeb Ben Abedramani, who claims to have been tortured in Qatari custody in 2020, prompting the Paris prosecutor's office to open up a preliminary investigation. Three investigating judges have since been assigned to the case, which typically indicates a progression from the initial preliminary investigation. Al Khalifi has denied any wrongdoing, describing Benad Bedramani and his co accusers as being petty professional criminals. Regardless of the outcome of that case, and indeed the myriad of others which seem to follow Al Khalifi around like a bad smell, one thing that he is certainly guilty of is running a total basket case of a football club. I have made two videos over the last couple of years about the total mismanagement of PSG and how Al Khalifi and the Qataris more broadly have got so many decisions so badly wrong after taking over at PSG at pretty much the perfect time in 2011, so feel free to watch them for more information on this specific issue. But the long and short of it is that Despite having a budget five times the size of the next highest spending league on team and the highest wage bill in all of Europe now, PSG still somehow managed to miss out on the 2016-17 and 2020-21 league on titles to Monaco and Lille, and they are yet to get their hands on the UEFA Champions League. Despite having a virtual monopoly on the greatest talent pool of young players anywhere in world football, PSG have totally neglected that gift from the gods in favour of assembling a sort of Harlem Globetrotter-style collection of superstars who are all undeniably fine footballers but are yet to form a truly great football team. The one time that PSG did reach the Champions League final in 2020, ironically enough, it was a native Parisian and a former PSG trainee that the club had let go in the form of Kingsley Coman, who scored the winning goal for Bayern Munich to defeat them. For the second successive campaign, PSG were knocked out of this season's Champions League at the round of 16 stage, failures which come in the immediate aftermath of perhaps the most extraordinary summer of recruitment in the entire history of European football, as PSG signed Ashraf Hakimi, Sergio Ramos and Gianluigi Donnarumma, amongst others, in addition to adding Lionel Messi to a forward line, which already included Neymar and Kylian Mbappe. Several former managers have either hinted at or spoken candidly about the disorder at PSG and the internal politics involved with that job, which can start to overshadow the football. The current PSG boss, meanwhile, is currently the subject of a staggering scandal all of his own. Three-time Ligue 1 Manager of the Year, Christophe Gaultier, who won the Ligue 1 title with Lille ahead of PSG in 2020-21, has just in this past week 
been accused of making frequent racist and discriminatory comments towards black and Muslim players during his time at Nice. Gaultier spent a single season at Nice in 2021-22, in between his title win at Lille and his job offer from PSG, so this is hardly ancient history. According to RMC Sport, a leaked email from former Nice director of football, Julien Fournier, outlines that Gaultier remarked to Fournier that Nice had too many black and Muslim players, which didn't reflect the majority white demographics of the city in which the club is based, refused to let Muslim players observe Ramadan, and turned down signings on the basis of a player's religion. Gaultier has denied the allegations, claiming that he has been enriched by diversity. PSG have refused to launch an investigation into him, or whether indeed the claims are accurate, despite calls from PSG's ultras for Gaultier to be sacked, if the leaked emails can be verified, though it is widely reported that the club plans to replace him over the summer regardless. For all of PSG's internal crises and mismanagement, they remain financially stable by virtue of their state ownership. The same cannot be said for just about any other professional football club in France ever since the collapse of the lucrative broadcast deal with the Chinese-backed Spanish multimedia group Media Pro. While Syria rejected an offer from Media Pro for their broadcasting rights, favouring a lower bid due to fears surrounding the company's viability, Lee Gun seemingly had no such reservations. A massive 3.3 billion euro package was agreed, in exchange for 80% of Ligue 1's broadcasting rights over the next four years, beginning in June 2020, which made it the second most lucrative broadcast deal in world football, behind only the Premier Leagues. Media Pro partnered with the TF1 group to create a new channel called Tele Foot, charging €25 Euros a month for their subscription, but they only managed to gain 600,000 subscribers, which was just 15% of the amount required just to break even, so in December 2020, only six months into the deal, Media Pro, and along with them, League Gun's lucrative broadcast deal, collapsed. It is difficult to overstate the financial implications that had on Ligue 1 and Ligue 2 clubs, but French journalists commented at the time that, overnight, following the collapse, PSG became the only team in the top two divisions of French football that didn't immediately go up for sale. The Amazon deal that replaced it was worth just €275 million Euros a year, leaving Ligue 1 with a €550 million Euro financial black hole. If French football was looking for some direction during these rocky times, they weren't about to find it at the French Football Federation. Financial shenanigans, alleged corruption, and political skullduggery are one thing, but the FFF is accused of having engendered a culture even more toxic than that. The federation that once pioneered world football is now viewed as pretty much the perfect encapsulation of all that is wrong with the French game. Less than two months ago, FFF president Noah Legrette was finally forced to resign. Legrette has been one of the most prominent figures in French football for more than three decades, having served as Juangon president from 1971 to 1992, and again from 2002 to 2011, Ligue 1 president from 1991 to 2000, vice president of the FFF, from 2005 to 2011, and president of the Federation since 2011. Legret's predecessor, Jean-Pierre Asqueletes, was forced to step down following France's scandalous and calamitous 2010 World Cup campaign. Having finished as runners-up at the 2006 World Cup, only losing to Italy on penalties after Zinedine Zidane was sent off in his last ever game in the final, France had high hopes heading to South Africa. Even France's qualification campaign was controversial though, requiring a Thierry Henry handball for them to get beyond the Republic of Ireland in their playoff, and before the tournament had even begun, the FFF took the unusual decision to announce that head coach Raymond Domenech would be leaving his position at the end of the tournament. A total lack of authority and mass infighting ensued. Nicolas Adelka, 
never one to shy from controversy, got into a profanity-laden argument with Dominic whilst France were losing to Mexico, having drawn their opening game against Uruguay, and when he was sent home, the rest of the squad boycotted training. France were dumped out of the World Cup, finishing bottom of their group with just a solitary point to their name, and the entire squad was suspended for their next game against Norway. Le Gret was elected with 54.39% of the vote, but he hardly represented a clean break from the previous administration, given his more than two decades in French football administration himself, and six years as vice president to his predecessor. A businessman and politician, Le Gret's food business is said to have a turnover in the hundreds of millions of euros, and he served as the mayor of Jangon from 1995 to 2008, under the banner of the Socialist Party, which, contrary to its name, isn't very socialist, but was for decades the largest political party of the French left, before splintering and ultimately collapsing at the 2017 French presidential elections. Le Gret is accused of having allowed a culture of sexual harassment and bullying to develop within the FFF, in addition to a series of allegations having made against him personally. Among those to have made accusations against Le Gret is Sonia Sued, a female football agent, who claims that Le Gret made a number of unwanted sexual advances towards her between 2013 and 2017. Le Gret, it is worth noting, is 81 years old. Meanwhile, Sued is 37, and she was therefore only 28 in 2013, whilst Le Gret was already in his 70s. The allegations against Le Gret could hardly be described as new, but he has always managed to brush them aside until the beginning of this year, when French magazine So Foot published a damning investigation, outlining a raft of institutional failings at the FFF, along with several inappropriate texts that Le Gret had allegedly sent to female members of staff. One of the messages read, you're quite pulpy, I would definitely put you in my bed, whilst another directed a woman to, come to my place for dinner tonight. The FFF denied the allegations and stated that they would be taking legal action against Sofoot for defamation. Meanwhile, Le Gret claimed that not only had he not sent the messages, he didn't even know how to send a text. Far be it from me to suggest that such a reputable character might not be telling the whole truth, and... Just in case his lawyers might be watching, I can assure you that that is definitely not what I'm saying, but that does have the faint whiff of overdoing it on the denial front. It's a bit like being accused of shoplifting and just claiming that you haven't got any hands. At the same time that all of this is going on, it is worth noting, Bernard Laporte, the president of the French Rugby Federation and the former head coach of the France national rugby team, was also facing serious allegations, and in January 2023, he was forced to step down a month after he was found guilty of corruption, fined €75,000, and given a suspended two-year prison sentence. Laporte still denies the allegations of corruption and is appealing, but it is pretty remarkable that the federations governing France's two most popular professional sports have been simultaneously plunged into crisis. Like Laporte, Le Gret has been forced to resign while still pleading his innocence. In the end, it wasn't the So Foot publication that got him, nor was it even his comments that he doesn't give a damn about Zinedine Zidane after handing his close ally Didier Deschamps a new two-year contract extension that was met with harsh criticism from the French public, including Kylian Mbappe, and forced an apology. When will administrators and politicians learn that they are unlikely to win popularity contests against football legends? No, it was actually an audit carried out by the French government into the FFF, which highlighted Le Gret's inappropriate behaviour towards women, and ruled that he failed to hold the necessary legitimacy to retain his job. It still took Le Gret 13 days to accept that the gig was up, aged 81, but fear not, despite that audit, which many have criticised for not going far enough, the octogenarian has retained his seat on the FIFA Council, which comes with a salary of €250,000 a year, and he will keep his role in FIFA's offices in Paris. Hopefully no women work there, I guess.
Sexual misconduct, or allegations thereof, are an all-too-common theme of French football. In April 2010, it was reported that five high-profile French footballers, Franck Ribéry, Sidney Govou, Hatem Ben Arfa, and Karim Benzema, were all being investigated for their roles as clients in a prostitution ring, operated inside of a Paris nightclub, with some of the women believed to be underage. Benzema and Ribéry asked for the cases against them to be dropped, claiming that they didn't know the 16-year-old girl involved, identified as Zahia de Her, was only 16 years old. The age of consent in France is 15, but prostitution was legal at the time, only if the worker was over the age of 18. The case went to trial, but the judge dropped the charges against both players, due to a lack of evidence that they were aware of the fact that de Heer was underage. Five years later, Benzema was arrested by police for his alleged role in blackmailing international teammate Mattia Valbuena over the alleged recording of a sex tape on a mobile phone. Benzema was subsequently suspended from the national team by the FFF. It took six years for the case to finally go to trial in November 2021, where Benzema was found guilty of trying to blackmail Valbuena with a sex tape, and the judge gave Benzema a one-year suspended sentence, fined him €75,000, and ordered him to pay Valbuena €150,000 in damages, plus €80,000 in legal fees. Benzema subsequently returned to the France squad in May 2021 against the wishes, according to some reports, of Didier Deschamps, ahead of a disappointing Euro 2020 campaign. Even more serious are the allegations of rampant child sex abuse in academy and youth team football in France, which has been reported extensively by French sports journalist Roman Molina and published by Josimar Football. According to Molina, there are several senior figures in both men's and women's football who have had sexual relations with underage players and are still working with young people in the sport. Child exploitation, both sexual and otherwise, has long been rife in football, not just in France and in France's former and current colonies, as alleged by Molina, but all over the world. The power dynamic between an aspiring athlete and those who hold the key to any future success that they might have in the sport, whether that be coaches, administrators, or agents, is such that it creates a breeding ground for some of the most appalling crimes imaginable. We have seen this in the United Kingdom, where child sex abuse revelations dating back almost five decades only came to light in mid-2016, before being seemingly rather quickly forgotten about as the next round of fixtures came up. It would be extremely naive to believe that such abuses had been consigned to the history books in the United Kingdom, let alone in France, where a toxic culture normalising and indeed perpetuating sexual misconduct has not just been widely reported, but confirmed by a government's audit. From the reprehensible to the downright bizarre come the scandals involving Paul Pogba and Kira Hamraoui over the last couple of years. In August 2022, it was reported that Pogba had been demanded to hand over millions of euros to avoid the dissemination of videos, allegedly compromising him. A month later, Pogba's own brother, Matthias, was charged and detained for his role in the alleged extortion plot after Pogba filed a complaint with the Turin Prosecutor's Office that he was the target of a 13 million euro blackmail plot. Amraoui, meanwhile, who plays for France's women's team and for PSG, was assaulted in the street in November 2021 after two masked men dragged her from a club-issued car and beat her with iron bars. The masked men were reported to have asked Amraoui whether she liked sleeping with married men whilst the assault was being carried out. It later transpired that former Barcelona fullback, and France international, Eric Abidal, had been having an affair with Hamraoui during her time at Barcelona. Far stranger still, Amraoui's club and international teammate, Aminata Diallo, who had been driving the club-issued car that Amraoui was dragged from on the night of her assault, was arrested on suspicion of having arranged the attack. Diallo was released after 36 hours, but she was re-arrested almost a year later, on charges of serious bodily harm. She denies any wrongdoing. 
The manager of France's women's national team during this time, Corinne Diac, who was also the first woman to coach a professional men's team in French football, was herself implicated in so many scandals that they could comprise an entire video all of their own before her contract was finally terminated last month, after several of the team's star players refused to represent France again, until she was gone. Le Gret had continued to back Diac, despite all of the controversies, hence the timing of her eventual dismissal, after he had also been forced out. On top of all that, French football has been mired by a rise in hooliganism and fan violence, which came to a head with a series of incidents in 2021, including Dimitri Payet being struck by a bottle thrown by Lyon fans, Marseille supporters storming their own club's training ground, smashing windows and stealing André Velasquez's briefcase, games having to be postponed or played behind closed doors, and some clubs even being hit with points deductions. Factor in more minor crises, like Kylian Mbappe's refusal to appear in any of the France national team's advertising, owing to a dispute with the FFF over his image rights, and perhaps it is little wonder that France is at great risk of being dislodged as a top 5 league in UEFA's coefficients by the Netherlands, and a pretty significant shock that they were able to reach a second successive World Cup final just a few months ago. Of course, that is because France have lots of immensely talented football players, arguably more than any other national team on earth, and that is the juxtaposition of French football, simultaneously brilliant, ingenious, and relentless, but also grubby, nefarious, and in some cases downright criminal. But don't worry, it was reported by RMC that following Noah Legret's enforced resignation, Emmanuel Macron has just the candidate in mind to come in and replace him and clean up French football for good. That's right, it is Michel Platini. Platini claimed that even if the French Football Federation did come calling, he wouldn't be interested, stating that he had already, quote, given enough. Well... At least there, we can end on a point of agreement. That is it for today's video, and if it had a slightly more chaotic and unstructured feel to it than usual, that is because it is a chaotic and unstructured topic made up of so many related and unrelated scandals, each one of them with several more tangents and rabbit holes that I had to fight myself from getting lost down, otherwise this video would have been even longer than it already is. Anyway, Thank you all very much as ever for watching. I hope that you enjoyed it. Hit the like button if that was the case. Let me know your thoughts down below in the comments. And make sure that you are subscribed and have notifications turned on, both for this channel and for my second channel, both of which should be on your screens now. And you can also find me on social media, on either Twitter or on Instagram, via the username at HITC7s on both, should you wish to do so.